Okay, so oh, there you go. Uh, an so just a little bit of introduction to the. Oh, oh that's the tree kangaroo. Uh, introduction to um, using R as a GIS with the raster package. Um, so firstly, just a geographic information system. Uh, it's it's not a software. It's a system of organizing information, and it provides a method to work with geographic data. Obviously, uh, there are a few freely available platforms for it, including Grass and QGIS, are some of the really major ones. I uh, will look at QGIS a little bit later just to kind of see what it looks like. And then there's obviously some commercial platforms like ArcGIS. Um, but we often like to use R for these sort of things uh, for a lot of the reasons that I'm sure you guys are here at the conference. Um, R is necessarily, script necessarily scripted. It means that everything is explicit, everything is reproducible, and everything is traceable. You can never have any kind of, you know exactly what has been done to all of the data at every step. Uh, R is also totally integrated um, at the data analysis stages. So once you've done all of your pulling out of your information from your data layers, you can just run straight into modeling. Uh, and in R, there's some really good advances with some packages like SF, uh, which has some just really cool ways to work with data. And so in a GIS, there's two primary types of data. You have vector data and you have raster data. Uh, vector data are points. So for instance, here on the Brisbane River, uh, I've just put a circle around uh, so this is obviously Google Maps, and I put a circle around some of their point data. In this case, it is the ferry, the ferry terminals going from UQ up to, I don't know where, where that is, up to near Mowbray Park. And so that's point data. You can link that point data together as line data, which has a beginning point and end point, and it just has a line um, between your spatially explicit points. And then you have a polygon. The difference between a polygon and a line is a polygon, the final point for a polygon is the same as the beginning one, and so it encloses in on itself. Uh, and a polygon can have other polygons within it as a whole. So if there was an island within a Brisbane River, we'd pull a polygon there and that would define that area is not part of the river. Um, yeah, and these are often associated with the data set. So for the uh, point data for the ferry terminals, you'd have which ferry terminal it is, the amount of people who visit it every day, uh, all that sort of data would be associated with it. Um, it doesn't have to be, but it can be. Uh, raster data. Uh, it's often taken from satellite imagery or at least derived from it. Um, so you, know, you have your Landsats flying around taking pictures and you can um, scrape all that data and it's a geographically explicit matrix. So here's just some data from ours uh, volcano data set. I've made it a little bit, uh, a little bit coarser. Um, but what you can see there is that it's just a matrix and then there are numbers within each cell of that matrix. Um, and the thing that makes a raster different from just an image is that each point on here, well, each point on that is geographically explicit. So it's related to a real point on the Earth. Uh, rasters can also be multi-layered. In fact, that's what the Landsat data is. That's a picture of the Earth taken with many different bands. And so at one band, you'll have um, a particular wavelength and another one and another one. And yeah, that's just an important attribute that raster data can have. And the thing which makes um, geographic data different from other forms of data is that, well, they're geographically explicit, but the only way that actually makes any sense is because of a thing called the coordinate reference system. Um, it's commonly called the projection. Um, it relates every single point in the data to a discrete point on the Earth's surface. Uh, it has a few different attributes to it. There's three kind of main ones. One is the ellipsoid, which, appro which approximates the Earth's curvature, um, the datum which, as it says here, specifies the location of the points on the ellipsoid and what is truly the projection, which then displays the GIS. You can have unprojected and projected ones. Um, so unprojected ones kind of, they mean nothing. So if you move 0.5 degrees, that changes how far you've moved, depending on what latitude you stand in. But with a projected one, like the UTM, if you, it's in meters or kilometers or something like that. So it makes a lot of sense. And so just to kind of demonstrate what is in a CRS. Um, here's an example of a global one. This is uh, Google's one, WGS, I think it is. I should have written it down. And this is what the world looks like with that projection. Everything looks good. Europe looks nice. Australia looks nice. Uh, but then if you move it to some different projections, here's one which is uh, specifically for Australia. Have I put it there? Oh, actually, no. OK, never mind. I did put it there. That's what Europe looks like if you do the Australian projection on it. So obviously, that's not what Europe looks like. And putting the wrong CRS with this data has completely distorted the data. So if we go back to Australia, uh, the direction is the same. If you move north there, it's actually accurately projected. 
the distance is similar, as is the area of Australia. But if you go to Europe, there is this incredible distortion because it has the wrong coordinate reference system. And then if you go to the world, everything just looks wrong. Uh, and if you go to a very, and then there's very specific projections. Um, oops, you missed one. Okay. Okay, we're not seeing it, but uh, this is with a projection specifically for, oh, there it is, for this area here. This is Moreton Bay, that's Brisbane River coming off there. It's highly accurate for that. You can look at a very small distance on that map and it will give you uh, the correct distance. A very small area will give you the correct area. There's very little distortion within this region. But if you go to a larger region like Australia, you start getting a bit of distortion. It starts turning off there to the side. As you go to Western Australia, it becomes less and less accurate. And then if you go to Europe, that is also wrong. It actually, surprisingly, still has a pretty good representation of area, um, but everything else is just wrong. And then I don't know what the world looks like because I tried to apply it and I just got errors. Um, and so yeah, so that's CRSs. That's how all that works. Um, and that was just an introduction to GIS. And now Brett is going to take over. Um, if you have not received the, uh, the data, uh, just let me know. We have a few USBs. We're now going to start working through the R script. So. Does that work? Yep. Sorry. So does everyone, does anyone need a USB? Um. <clears throat> okay, so today we're going to be modelling, there's a bird in southeast Queensland called a, a lyre bird. Well, it's in Australia. Mm. Okay. There's a bird in Australia called a lyre, Albert's lyre bird. Um, for the birders around here, they're pretty keen to see these most likely. They mimic um, all sorts of sounds, so chainsaws, cameras. Um, I'll just quickly show you one of it doing some construction noises. No, nope, it's not going to work for me. <laughs> okay, anyway, the point is, so these birds are, they mimic all sorts of different things, um, children's laser guns. Um, quite a sought after bird. They have a very specific niche that they live in. Um, so we've gotten some data. How do I go back to um? How do I go back to your? Sorry. Sorry, I'm using someone else's computer. How do I get back to the QGIS from here? QGIS back on before, so it was it was under the um, under this. Uh, okay. Okay. So. Okay, so we've got some live bird occurrence data here, which are the little green dots. So. This is from the Atlas of Living Australia, and basically when people go into the field just on a bushwalk or whatever, they come across um, animals or plants, they can take photos, coordinates, and they upload it to a site. So we've got this big database of known occurrences. <clears throat> so what we want to do is we want to put these um, point data into you know, spatial data. So we want to know the extent of where they are. Based on the point data, we'll extract different um, environmental variables about the vegetation, the elevation, and whether it's in a protected area or not. And then we'll use that data, build a, build a model, and then predict the spatial extent of them. So just to sort of recap over what Dale was talking about before. Um, so this is our point data. It's just single points with x, y coordinates, and there's some um, data attributed to it. In this case, it's the presence of lyrebirds. Then we have a polygon. So this is um, a national park down in northern New South Wales. And then we have the raster data. Um, so if we zoom in on it again, you can see that it's pixels. So it's just a 30 by 30 metre pixel with a number that corresponds with something. With, for this, it's our altitude. And then we'll have another one that will correspond to vegetation cover. So we'll go into R. Um, so the first part of it, I'm just going to sort of show you how to do some of the simple things that you might be familiar with using ArcGIS. Um, so just checking the attributes of your data, 
and stuff like that. So we'll just start off with two <coughs> simple parameters here. So we've got RM, which is just remove all the old data. Yep, so that'll remove all the old data and then graphics off. That'll just turn any of the old graphics stuff off. Um, I just find it's a good idea to do this at the beginning just so you've got a clean slate. Um, the three libraries that we'll need, Ruster, so that's dealing with all of our Ruster data, RGDAL and RGOS, which deal a lot with um, vector data. Then we'll set seed so that anything we do that has random um, data, you know, random generators in it is going to remain the same so it's reproducible. Then for this one here, set working directory. So this is going to tell the, com well this is going to tell R the, the path to follow where all the data will be stored. So if everyone can just inside the um, quotation marks just put the folder that all that data that you got is in and then from then on we won't have to constantly change the working directory. Uh, they, you no, know, they've been around for a while. They shouldn't. I'll send Dale will come over and maybe. You're right. Has everyone else got the packages? We put some fiddling on, on Debian, so if you're running on Linux 2.3, you might have to download the Linux dependencies of uh, the Linux uh, okay. download. It's pretty hard when you figure out which ones you need. Yep, okay. I got the version warning, but it didn't affect the installation. Yep, okay. Uh, this is good. Okay. So everyone's good up to here? Next thing, so next thing we're going to do is um, import those two vector layers, so the live, live words, which were the point data. So we can use a, pack, uh, a function called read OGR. That just requires a directory path and then the actual name of the shape file. So because we've already set the working directory, we can just put this little, this little dot here in between the quotation marks and that just says go to the working directory that you've set. So if you haven't set your working directory or it's somewhere else, just change that path. So okay, this will give us uh, our live bird occurrences and then it's just telling us a little bit of the spatial features attributed with that. Um, we'll have a bit of a look at them in a minute. Um, that's kind of a big file so it might take a little bit of time to load, maybe a minute. <coughs> Instead of shapefile? Oh, okay, there's there's quite a few different functions to read it in. Um, I use read OGR just because it's GDAL and GDALs are pretty stable, good good one to use. Okay, so that's read in, so we'll read in the protected areas. Uh, I think that's somewhat big too, but it shouldn't take too long. Okay, so they're loaded in now. So. We can um, quickly just map them, see what they look like, which is the same as anything else that you want to plot in R. So it's just the plot function and then the name of the uh, variable. So plot liebird and that should... Okay, so that's plotted up all the liebird occurrences, um, which looks the same as what we had in the... GIS. Okay, so that's reading in vector data. Next thing we're going to read in some raster data. Um, so this is where we start using the raster package. So we've got, we're going to read in a variable, call it veg. It's a stack, so it's 
a multi-layer, so it has a whole heap of layers associated with it, like what you would get with satellite imagery. Um, so we're going to read that in. So if you've already set the working directory, you don't need to put anything in front of the name of the file. Um, if you haven't set the working directory, then it would just go within the quotation marks in front. So if we... Um, okay. Okay, so that's read that in now. So now, again, we can plot this veg layer and we'll see how it's a multi, like a stack. It'll plot up all four of the different layers within that stack. So there's the first layer, second, so on. Okay, so we use the function stack for multiple layers. Uh, there's some others you can use as well. And then next we're going to um, bring in an elevation layer. So this is just a single layer, so we can just use Ruster for this. So if we bring that in. And that is a multi-layer, not a multi like an equivalent for OCR info, where it's just a four of those layers and stuff. Yeah, yeah, there would be. I'm not 100% sure off my head. I, I usually just throw something. I just throw it in like a QGIS or something just to quickly visualise it and and see what it's like from there. Okay, so if we plot that elevation layer. Okay, so then we can, we've got the elevation now. So we can, just like any other data in R, we can find out a little bit bit about the attributes of it. So the first thing we'll look at is uh, n layers. So this is going to tell us the number of layers within a data set. So if we look at how many layers are in that veg data, so it's given us back that it has four layers in it, which makes sense. Now for this vegetation layer, we're only interested in one layer and that's layer number two. So that's the layer that corresponds with um, vegetation cover. So just like other data, uh, other data, it's just a matter of um, subsetting. And to subset so that you get a specific layer within R, um, it's just double square brackets and then the number of the layer that you want to select. So we want to select layer number two from veg. Yep. Um, so again, if we type n layer veg, uh, and layers should be an S on the end of that. Okay, so we've got one layer now. So there's no point holding on to all that extra data if we don't need to. It just makes R a little bit slower. Okay, so everyone's keeping up all right so far? Are there any, if there's questions, just throw your hand up and we can address them. Um, so we've got this data. It's, um, it's, it covers a larger area than what we actually need for this analysis. And I guess if you want one of the potential drawbacks of R is it can be a little bit slow with a, a lot of these large data sets. So we want to try and cut it down so we can save on computing time. Um, so the way we do that is first we'll just create an extent layer. So it's simply, uh, it's basically it's going to make a rectangle for us that has, you know, an X and a Y coordinate up the top and an X and Y coordinate down the bottom. And then it'll use that to crop all of the other layers. So basically like a, cu uh, a cookie cutter, it'll just come in and just take that little bit you want and it'll throw the rest away. So first we need to set up um, an extent to clip with. So if we run this, so it's a function called extent and what it wants is a y, get this wrong, a y coordinate for the top and a y coordinate for the bottom and then an x coordinate for the top and an x coordinate for the bottom. Um, but you know like everything if you just type in 
question mark extent, it'll tell you. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's another thing, um, and we will get to that. So, within R, uh, with your, so say something like QG, uh, ArcGIS, you can throw data in there, and it doesn't matter if it's different. Uh, they sort of have underlying ways of dealing with it, although those ways don't really deal with it that well. Um, you can do wrong things. So, in R, uh, you can't you know, use two bits of data against each other unless they have the same coordinate reference system. And they need to be same coordinates, same extent, and same, if they're a raster, they need to have the same pixel size. So we'll go through and we'll, um, I'll show you how we can go about changing all that. But yeah, that's something that it needs to be is the same. And really, if you're working in something like ArcGIS, you should have it in the same. It's good practice. So if we look at um, veg now, if we if you just type in veg, you can see all of the, I guess all the spatial data that's associated with it. So we can see the dimensions. So remember, it's just it's just a matrix with spatial data attached to it. So n rows, n curls, number of cells. Then it has the spatial data, so how big each of the cells is, 30 by 30, which is in metres. Um, then the extent here, so that's telling us, you know, the X and Y. Then the coordinate reference system, so the CRS. Um, and then the other important thing is the values that it ranges from down the bottom. So then we can also access uh, specific parts of that data. So we can look if we just want to know what the CRS is. So this comes in handy if you're trying to compare two different data sets to each other or you're trying to subset based on specific things. Um, we can see what the resolution is just by typing in res. So we can see that's 30 by 30. Um, <coughs> now it's it's very easy to do um, raster calculations, if anyone knows of raster calculations from maybe ArcGIS. So that vegetation data has been scaled up for some reason when it was created. So it's a percentage of cover, so it should be between 0 and 100. Uh, if we look at the values here, it's between 92 and 207. They've added 100 on for some reason during the processing. So we want to bring it back down to what it should be between roughly 0 and 100. Um, and the way you do that is if you just type in the variable veg minus 100. So you can do any sort of maths on it just by doing this. And that will just every single cell within that matrix, it'll minus 100 from. So again, if, so we've run that. So if we look at it, it's, there's probably a few outliers that are in the minus, a few that are above 100, but you know, mainly it's between 0 and 100 now, which is what we want. Okay, so Sorry, apart from a scalar transformation, like adding and subtracting, would it be valid to do any other Boolean transformation? Like, could you just multiply that by a tungsten and subtract the tungsten so it is within the range exactly of 0 to 100? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could do that too. You can so you can do um, stretching and then yeah. max kind of stuff. You can you can do any sort of maths you could imagine, like that. Uh, which is which is one of the good things about R. You know, any programming you can do it with so much ease. Uh, so the next thing, okay. So we know that we need to have the coordinate reference system of everything in the same so that we can play with it. So first, we're going to look at how we do that with vector data. Um, so there's this function called sp transform, and all that wants is uh, the name of the data set you want to transform and the coordinate reference system that you want to use. Um, so you might have noticed, if we look back at this vegetation one here, that that's a coordinate reference system there, and it's big and bulky to try and put that whole thing in these brackets. So there's another thing we can do. 
which is just use something called an EPSG code. And if you just go onto Google and just type in EPSG and then whatever coordinate system it is, it will just flick you back a number like this. And it just makes life easy. Um, so we're going to use uh, this 3577 here. So this is a UTM that's specific for the whole of Australia. So it's nice because it keeps Australia in a good projection, but you can also measure everything in metres across the whole of Australia. And of course, if you can measure something in metres, it's a lot better for analysis. So we'll run that. OK, so that's changed the coordinate system for Lyrebird now. Now we'll do the same thing for protected areas. So again, if we have a look at the CRS for protected areas. So you can see at the beginning there, now it's given us that 3577. Okay, now to do this for raster data, um, slightly different, but it achieves the same thing. So we use something called project raster. Um, so the first thing we're going to put in is the data set that we want to change. And CRS equals, and then again put that CRS code in. And then you can do a couple of other things. So it's 30 by 30 metre at the moment. We're just going to make it 90 by 90 metre just to speed up processing times a bit. So you can change the resolution to 90. And then um, because you're resampling, you want to use the correct method to keep it's, so it's in ca categorical data, I guess, you know, it's to an exact metre, so you want to keep it so it's in an exact metre. Um, so if we use this bilinear, that would just keep it as an exact metre. So that will probably take a minute or so. OK, so that's done now. So let me just see what it looks like now. OK, so we can see now there's 90, 90 by 90 metres in the resolution. And that CRF is in the 3577 that we want. So that's good. Um, so just as we can check resolution, we can check extent of an object just by typing extent. And so that'll give us the X, the Y, maximum and minimum. So just think if you have a Cartesian plane, just an XY plot. And that's basically what GIS stuff is. It's an XY plot with coordinates running on each side. You stick your data on there and it will just tell you the max and the min for the X and the Y. Uh, we can also use BBOX. So just like everything else in um, R, there's, there's a million different ways to do it. Some ways are better than others. Others are just personal preference. Now we're going to, so we made an extent layer before that we called bounds. So this one here, which is just minimum and maximum, so it's basically just a rectangle. And we're going to use that rectangle just to crop our data to the study area that we want it to be in. Uh, so we, for rasters, we, oh actually for raster and vector, we can just use this function here, crop. And so that just asks for the data set and then the cropping layer. And the cropping layer can be uh, a shapefile as well, so you can just put a shapefile in there, and it'll just crop it to the min and the max of that shapefile. So if we run that. So we can run all of them.
So now we'll plot the live bird data. Okay, so now we've just simply got data that's within our little x and y points, uh, our extent. And so now we're going to start to get into a little bit of analysis. So now we've cleaned our data up, we've got it into the CRSs that we want it in, we've got it to the extent we want it so we can process nice and quickly. Uh, so now we'll start to do a little bit of analysis. So using the slope, um, the DEM, we're going to get some terrain features. So specifically we want to look at slope. So some of the areas where these live birds are found in, there's, there's really steep cliffs and there's some really, really steep areas. Um, they don't like those kind of areas. They like the, the plateaus. Well, at least that's what we think. And aspect... Um, that heavily influences the vegetation type. Are uh, they like rainforest? So you're less likely going to find them on the northern slopes where you get, uh, you know, drier conditions and sort of the drier eucalyptus forest. So we're going to run, uh, this is in the raster package, it's called terrain. And you put, in a, you put a DEM into it and we're just going to get slope and aspect, but you can get uh, a whole heap of different sort of DEM derived characteristics of it. Uh, even if you're doing like the hydrological modeling and you want to get um, stream flow and all that kind of stuff, this will give it to you. Um, so what we want to get, so we want to get slope and we want to get aspect. And then the unit, so it can be in degrees or radian depending on uh, what you're doing. And then this neighbors just says, so we'll put in eight. So it just says, look at the eight cells around it and use that to derive your slope. So you can make more cells or less cells, depending. So run that. All right, um, and now that's going to give us, so this variable slope and aspect, if we just, I'll run that. So if we go down to the bottom, so we can see it has two layers. This is what this last one here is for. Two layers. And the first one is called slope. And the second one's called aspect. So we're gonna have we're gonna plot this slope one out. So it'll be the name of the variable and then dollars slope. Okay, so this is giving a slope now. So we can see, you know, as it's, uh, as it's green, it's very steep. When it's white, it's very flat. So we can see there's uh, quite a few areas of green in there. Okay. Uh, now, maybe you want to have a look at this layer in, um, you know, uh, ArcGIS or something like that, just to double check it, have a bit of a look over it. Or you want to save this layer because you don't want to have to, it's a very big analysis that's taken a long time, you don't want to have to, you know, run that analysis every time you run the script. So you can just write, you can just write it out as a raster and then later on, when you go to rerun that analysis, you just bring it in like a normal GeoTIFF. So this function here, write raster, will let us do that. So the first thing is the name of the variable, then where you, uh, the name you want it to be saved as. And obviously uh, with GIS data, you can have a whole heap of extens extensions associated with them. The most common is TIF, which is just a TIFF file. Uh, and then the driver that you want to use to save it as. So in this case, it's GTIFF. Uh, if you go, if you're not sure of what 
you need to put in there, if you just go into the um, help, it'll tell you it's got a list of all the different types of data it can save it as and then the driver you need to use. And then this overwrite function is usually handy. Um, if you have it set to true, it will just overwrite that file every time. If you have it set to false, it won't let you rewrite the file. So we'll write this file. Okay, so now that has written us a file. Um, so I haven't put anything in front of the file name there. So that is, it's just going to save it to the working directory that we set previously. Uh, so like the other cases, if you want it to write to a different file, you just need to include that path in front of the name of the, the layer. Okay, so we're just going to create another extent. Um, this is just to zoom in on a specific layer of a, a specific area of a layer. Um, so you can see, so Dale's written this piece of code and you can see he's included um, the X min, X max, Y min, Y max. Uh, so there's different styles of writing. They all sort of achieve the same thing, I guess. So we'll just create another extent layer there. Um, I usually just put it in like a GIS and just get the coordinates that way. That's usually the easiest way. Uh, so there are, there are some things that, you know, visualization is a lot harder in R, um, but analysis-wise it's a lot quicker. Yeah, so I just go into a GIS and do it, or Google Maps. Okay, so now we're going to plot, um, we're going to plot a layer, which we call veg. So we're going to plot that vegetation layer and we're going to crop it. Within the plot, we're going to crop it to the shadow area. So we're not making a variable by itself because uh, we don't really want to change the veg, although I guess we could make a new variable name, but this works. So we'll plot and just zoom in on that specific layer. Okay, so that's given us... This is zoomed into a specific area. Um, so the reason why I show you this is these white strips along here, they're, um, they're sort of in this area. There's a lot of spots that just, they just drop straight off in sheer cliff. Um, and the, the satellite sensors, when they come through, they can't pick it up, so it just becomes NA values. Uh, so we're just going to run a little function that will just turn those NA values into um, the mean of the values surrounding it. So we want to get rid of those NA values. Um, it's probably not necessary, but it's just a nice little thing to show you. Uh, so we want to get rid of those NA values. So to do that, we're going to create a function called fill NA, which just simply identifies if... So it just moves through each cell and identifies if the cell is um, an NA cell. And if it's an NA cell, it just gets the mean of the cells surrounding it and gives that value to that cell. Um, and so it's just a function with an if and an else statement in it. So if it's NA, do this. Um, else, just return the same value that it already has. So that's a function that we've made. Now we want to run that function through something called focal. So a focal filter, um, it will run through, you, you give it a specified matrix. So here we've got 177. So that's saying, um, so what a focal filter will do is it'll get your one, your one value in the middle and then it'll create a 7 by 7 matrix around it. And then it'll do a specific function. And that one cell in the middle, it will turn into that specific function. So 
For instance, the easiest one in function, you could just put mean. So it'll get, for each single cell, it'll get 7 by 7. Work out the mean, and then it'll revalue that cell as the mean. So it's a way of smoothing data, but also uh, with this NA function, it's just going to fill the values that have nothing in them with a 7 by 7 matrix around it. That makes sense. So if we run, we'll run that. Yeah, so it, it will miss out the edges. Yep. So um, if you are going to run this, it's a good idea to have your um, extent a bit beyond your study area because, yeah, the ones on the outside. I won't do anything for this fill NA one, but usually it'll, it does something with them. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's plot that now. So we're going to plot that same um, area. And... Okay, so now we can just see that the, there's none of those um, NA value streaks running through there. So that's just simply filling the data gaps. Was that was that using the um, was that because you were using the code or? It's it's because Linux is a case sensitive operating system and the the bit oh, okay. of the PPMG has to be lowercase for us. Oh, okay. Running on Windows, it's not case sensitive, so it can't be wrong. Mm -hmm. It turns out. And there you go. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> um. So now we're just gonna sort of take it the next step. So of course, one of the good things about R is that you can loop things and you can automate things and you can, you know, if you've got large data sets that you're doing similar things to, it's, it's quite good for handling this. Um, so we're just going to, what we're going to end up doing is having a for loop here uh, where it reads the data in, it transforms the data, it crops the data and then it puts a new, a new variable into that data for the name. Um, and instead of having to do it you know, over and over, we're just going to run a loop and make it. Ah, uh, yeah, no, you can, yeah, you can use L apply as well. But same thing. Um, so first thing for a loop, we'll make a make a um, just an empty variable that it will put everything into. Uh, and then we've got this variable called name shape. So that's just the names of all the shape files that we've got. So then, so first thing it's going to do is it's going to read the shape files in using that uh, name shape variable we created. And then each of those shape, each of those files, it'll just go through the list and transform it, crop it, give it a new column with a name in it. So uh, geographical data, just like other data, it has a data frame attached to it that has a whole heap of data in it and you can add columns to those data frames if you want to add new information to it um, and you can go to those data frames and they'll usually have quite a bit of extra information about the data associated with them. And then it's finally going to put it into a list and then it's going to let us know how it's all going. Um, this can sometimes be good when you've got very big lists. So. Um, we're creating the name column. Oh, no, because in, in a little bit we're going to um, just do some summary statistics about how many animals are in each of the national parks. So it's just a way for us to... So that will, yep, that's running. Okay. 
So if we um, print out that New South Wales National Parks that we just made. So it's a, it's a list with um, four spatial data frames for each list. Okay, so we've got all of those data frames in a list now. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to combine them into one single layer. So we want them to keep their individual, um, you know, areas, their individual bounds, but we want them to all be on the one layer so that we can work with them. Um, and so there's this good function called do call. So for do call, you just simply put in a, um, a function that you want it to do and then what you want it to do it on. So we're going to use bind. Uh, it's just going to bind all those four polygons together to create one polygon that will still keep the four individual areas. So we can see it has five features in it now. Um, and what we'll do is we'll plot that. Okay, so you can see it's plotted all four of the national parks. And then what we're going to do is we're going to plot the bounds. And it should be. So it's worked. So it's um, cut them all to the study extent area. So that's, that's worked. Okay. Um, so now we're just, so this is one of the things that I kind of really like about it with R is that you can treat the geographic data just as you treat any other sort of data in R, you know, whether it's data frames or vector layers or any of that, you know, you can treat it the same way. Um, so we're going to, so we're just going to subset um, the protected areas. So that was so we've got two different layers that we're still dealing with. One's for Queensland, one's for New South Wales, um, and then we'll put them together to form one big protected area layer. So we're just going to recode the protected areas, the Queensland side, um, and just keep this name abbreviation. Okay. Then we want to rename the call names. <coughs> so this has now given us So okay, so they've got they've got names, the names of the national parks. No other data with them now, uh, except for the spatial stuff. So now we're going to um, do something called union, which just merges them both together, so that we've got a full protected area data set that covers the study area. All right, so um, I'm going to hand it over to Dale now. This is starting to get into some of his stuff that he wrote. He'll be able to explain that a bit better. Um, I'll just be floating around if there's questions. Um, yeah, so for some of that stuff we just passed, right, I was getting into um, some of my lines of code. So if you want, we can just go back there and go through some of it. Okay, so just there where we did... Um, this little plotting, that was all good. That's just showing our data. Uh, and then for the Queensland data, it's one of the issues with geographic data that you often have to work interjurisdictional. And so in this case, because we're trying to model the presence of lyrebirds in this area, which happens to be over the Queensland and New South Wales border, we need to try to take these disparate data sets 
and put them together into something which actually makes sense. And so in this case, it's um, having a map of where the protected areas are in Queensland and in New South Wales. Um, and just because they are disparate data sets, uh, the Queensland protected area doesn't have a nice neat name variable. They have one called name of brev, which is kind of close. So we're going to use that. I'll just put this on, sorry for the recording. So it's got one called name of brev. Uh, we then just rename that to name here. And we have to code it as a character because it's in there as a factor. It just makes it a bit easier for later. And now we have these little functions which just minus the data. And so what that actually is, it's doing a really cool thing, which I really appreciate. It takes, um, it returns the protected areas in Queensland, which is called prot areas, and then removes all the areas which cross over with New South Wales. And so what we're doing is just making this really clean layer with nothing which touches New South Wales, because otherwise we get, when we do a union, all these very tiny um, little areas which are given a really unique designation being half a national park in Queensland, half a national park in New South Wales. And so it really cleans it up. And so we say that as an object called protected areas, no New South Wales. Then we do the same thing for New South Wales to Queensland, because even though it should work perfectly just once, there's sometimes just tiny bits of overlap, even if you do it. And so this just keeps it once again really neat. Um, and now you've just got two data layers, protected areas in New South Wales, no Queensland, which are just the protected areas between the jurisdictions. And here we've got a cup, uh, just one little line, uh, which, because oh, if we just look at it now, um, oh wait, I've rejoined it, just pro areas. And if you, if you look for the, um, uh, the aspect of it called data, what you have is, um, on the left-hand side, you have all of the national parks within Queensland, and on the right-hand side, all the national parks in New South Wales, and there's these areas because they couldn't join in together. And so we just have this little thing here which says for every value which is an A in name one, um, so these bottom four there, fill it with all the values in name two which are in A. And so this just gives us, um, a, just keeps it neat. For areas data and you can see now we just have a single naming variable which has our entire unified protected areas data set with the only data attribute it has being the national park okay cool and so now that we have that let's just have a little plot have a look for areas yeah so you can see I hope you can see there's a line going through here and that's actually the Queensland New South Wales border yeah. And so the reason why we're mapping this area is firstly because it's really good to show what you do with interjurisdictional stuff, but also for lyrebirds. As Brett said before, they're a rainforest species, and there happens to be some uh, really big world heritage rainforest in this area where they're relatively common. So that's why we've chosen this area. Okay. And now we're able to take that uh, polygon data set, and we can convert it into a raster data set using a function called rasterize. And so we say take this data set, in this case prot areas, and then consider the data, the raster data set elevation. We want you to have a raster which has all the same attributes as elevation. So it has the same resolution. It has the same, let's just get it up. So create a blank raster data set which has these same dimensions, has this resolution, this extent, this coordinate reference system, make it completely blank, and then fill it with the data which is present in prot areas. And so what we have in prot areas is this listing of these, I think it's nine national parks. And so what we will receive, um, if we just look at it here, pro areas rest. Oh, plot it. Is a data set which has the all of those same distributions as the elevation data set, but it's colored by which national park it was. So for instance, I think that would have been national park number three or whatever, judging on its color. So now we have a raster data set with NAs and integer values, where the values are derived from the protected area data sets. Okay. Okay. And we're going to do a, a function called reclassify now. Reclassify is a really useful function uh, where you don't care a lot about the details. So in this case, we have these eight national parks, 
And for our model that we're going to generate at the end, we're going to assume it won't matter if you're in Rosen's Lookout or Namimba National Park, you're probably going to have the exact same level of protection for the live birds. So we're going to simplify it and do this function reclassify. What reclassify does is it takes a raster layer, in this case, pro areas rast, and it takes a matrix, or you can just give it a vector as long as that vector could have three columns if it was a matrix. And so it says for every value between negative infinity and zero, return zero, so all zeros, um, for every value between one and infinity, return one, and then if you have an NA, just return it as a zero, it's the same. And now we have a look at that, we have the exact same data, except now it's in ones and zeros, with one being a protected area and zero being everything else. Cool. Okay, so now uh, very soon we're going to go into, uh, in a little bit, we're going to do some of our, our modeling. And so what we want to do is we want to get everything all stuck together neatly. Um, so we're going to do a function here, stack, which is, we, we did stack before when we were reading in data, but within raster, you can perform a stack on two different raster objects. And so we'll run that, we get an error. We knew that was going to happen, don't worry. And so if we look at it, we can do a little function all and just see if everything's the same there. And so we looked at the resolution of veg and elevation, and it turns out they have different resolutions. And so let's just have a look at that. Uh, where's veg? So vegetation is 30 by 30, and elevation is, is 90 by 90. So remember before, we, we projected it to a, a coarser, um, coarser, coarser resolution so we could process it a little faster. Um, and so once again, we're going to do another project raster function. We're going to take veg and project it to um, the elevation specifications. We could have done this the other way, even though veg has a smaller projection, what it would mean is that you would just have nine cells all next to each other would be filled with the same value because it's a smaller resolution, but you can still project something bigger to something smaller, it'll just be full of lots of um, unimportant values, uh, not unimportant, lots of redundant values. Okay, so perform that project raster. And now they are all the same, which is nice. Okay. So now we want to perform that stack to get all of that important data together. So that data was the elevation data, uh, the slope and aspect, but we're just going to subset to slope, then to aspect as well as two separate layers, uh, veg and protected area RAS. So whether or not uh, each location is within a protected area. So that is our data. And so this should send up, yep, five different ones. So this is, this is our multi-layer object. We have um, elevation, slope, aspect. And so we haven't had a proper look at aspect. But if you look at that, it makes sense. There's this, you know, these side here are green, you know, roughly representing north. Um, but one important thing with this aspect as an ecological variable doesn't make sense as it is uh, because one degree is ecologically very similar to 359 degrees. They're just two degrees off, but in this particular data set, we're not going to go into it. If this was a real analysis, we'd have to convert this to circular data um, just to accommodate 360 being the same as zero. Um, but that's what it is at the moment, which is fine. Okay, so we'll just have a little look at the names. Uh, most of them make sense. Dem is a little bit confusing, so that was digital elevation model. Uh, we're just going to re rename all of this to really interpretable things, so DEM becomes elevation, layer one becomes vegetation, and layer five becomes protected. So now we look at those names, they should be all good. Yep, very easy to interpret. Okay, so now we're going to have, now that we've got all of our data together in this easy to look at way. We're going to do some of the exploratory statistics first before we get into any of the actual modeling. Um, so we're going to use a function called extract. What extract does is it takes um, some data, uh, two different types of spatial data, and it will take information from one of them depending on the conditions of the other. So in this case, we're going to have the data layer protected areas. 
um, which has the eight different kind of protected areas, and the lyrebird data. And what Extract will do is give us a count of how many lyrebirds, whoa, that was too much, of how many lyrebirds a visual, uh, of how many lyrebirds have been seen in each national park. And so here we go, we look at this data frame. We have, you know, this observation of a lyrebird was found in border ranges. I do not know what's happening. Yeah. Okay, so we have point ID, and so in this case, this is the first lyrebird observation in our data. Poly ID, and in this case, this is the sixth polygon and border ranges. And it, from this, we can just do um, a table and identify how many lyrebirds are in each national park. So we have this, a lot of lyrebirds have been found in Lamington quite a few on border ranges in Springbrook and then hardly any in this little one called Limpinwood. And if you remember, we had eight national parks before. So there are two national parks which simply had no lyrebirds found in them. Yeah. So the lyrebirds are the third tag. Tagged. Um, so these are just lyrebird sightings. These are just lyrebird sightings. Yeah, you mean for actual like seeing where they've gone and stuff. Yeah. I assume people have done tagging studies before. But as they, they have this very specific area, they live in ecologically, they live on the top of mountains in forests. That doesn't mean they're in danger of going extinct or anything, so I don't actually think they're all that high conservation priority. Um, they just happen to be a very easily modelled species, particularly because, as you saw before, so much of this area is protected, so they're at no risk of habitat loss, at least. No, so this is just a count of every time someone's seen one. And so, so it's going to be subject to yeah, it, it absolutely could be, and in fact, we're going to be getting into that fairly soon. And so in this, even though we have this uh, complete different pattern here with so few at Limpenwood, for all we know, Limpenwood might have 400 billion lyrebirds in it, but no one ever goes into Limpenwood because it's surrounded by a lake of fire or something. And so no one's seen them there. Um, and so there's, yeah, there's all these things you have to consider when we're actually trying to see what, what is our data, and we're going to get into some of that in just a minute. Yeah. Um, so what is this? OK, so now we're going to make a, um, just a list of, so what we're doing here is we're going to take the, the ecological variables that we got before, which we saved in DAT, and we're going to extract that data for each of the different protected areas. And so we're going to be using um, a function called mask. And so we create a list here called masked. Uh, it's just empty, and there's as many objects in the list as there are national parks. And so we're going to run another for loop here. Obviously, as we said before, we could do this in all sorts of apply family functions. We just chose to do it in a for loop. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to mask. Uh, we're going to take this, this raster data, our data set that was called DAT, and we are going to mask it for the first protected area in our data set. So this is in a loop. After that, we're just going to uh, name it, what that, data, what that particular protected area is called, so a member, Lamington, those sort of things. And then I, so I always put these things and they just make me kind of feel good as we're doing this so I can see what's going on under the hood. So, and so some of these will take a long time. You've, I'm sure you've noticed that my computer is quite slow. We intentionally chose that because all of your computers should be faster than this, so no one should be getting left behind. Yeah. I don't even know, I've got a snail on the front, and I think it's an accurate description of my machine. Okay, so as, as I was saying before, we have these national parks, but we don't really know much of the attributes of them. For instance, the reason why we may have none at Limpenwood is because Limpenwood is insanely steep, and no one can get to Limpenwood. It could be all these sort of things. And so now we are finally going to use one of the apply family functions. We're going to use a sapply, or oh, s apply. Um, go over that list mast and apply a function which we're about to define using another function called cell stats. Cell stats is from raster. What cell stats will do, actually I haven't shown any of these. That's rude. Um, so let's, let's look at the first one. Plot masked one. That should work. Okay, masked one is tiny apparently. Yeah, okay, so now we have um, 
we've cropped all of our raster data to the geographic extent of one of our national parks. So what is that one? So I think that's border ranges. No, yeah, it is. Yeah. So we've cropped it to that, and now we have this specific data just for border ranges. So we're going to use a function cell stats, as I said before. Um, if you were just to take this, so let's take masked six, um, and we will run a mean on it, because we want to see what the mean elevation is for this. It returns another raster layer. And so we need to use a function which can just go in there and extract the information, and that function is cell stats. And so we say here for mean elevation, uh, run an S apply over masked, and the function is you take the cell stats of the elevation. And so we need to specify that uh, because we need to say which layer to remove the data from. The function is mean, and NARM is true, otherwise we just get NAs for everything because the vast majority of this data is NA. So mean elevation. Okay, and so now we have the mean elevation for each national park. Uh, let's visualize that and make it easier. So you can see Springbrook CP, sorry, sorry, the end of the words are a little bit cut off. The lowest border ranges, Lamington and Linfernwood, are all approximately the same elevation, um, at least for the mean. Um, yeah, so that's just one way you can summarize some of these uh, polygons that we've, that we um, created before. And we'll just do that again for slope. Let's have another look at it. Is that slope? Yeah, so the mean slope, Limpenwood is by far the steepest. So maybe I was right before when I said it was just insane. It's an average of about 40, 40 degrees. Uh, Springbrook Hour is a very flat area, apparently an, an, average, an average slope of about 7 degrees, so a lot more, a lot fairer. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not fully sure what mean raster actually does, because if you plot it, it, it hasn't just returned you a raster. Oh, what have you done? It hasn't just returned you a raster, which is the mean. Um, so let's, let's do that. Oh, one was a terrible option, sorry. And so you see that you still see all the variability within it. So... Oh, you know, good. It does make sense. Yeah, okay, so how many layers is in mast? Let's see if we can. Yeah. Okay, so we have five. Yeah, okay. And that makes sense because we have um, the scales now up to about 300. So let's just see the scales if we just do masked. Oh, wait, we can't just do that because it's several layers. Yeah. Yeah, so that makes sense that it's just timed all these things together because they have these completely disparate levels of what they'll be assessing. Thanks, Brett. Excuse me. Okay. Okay, now we're going to start doing a function which I prefer to get values. Um, in fact, I didn't know get values existed for a while because I just did these. Um, it's called, oh, sorry, I didn't know cell stats existed. I just use get values. So what get values does is it once again takes this raster and returns um, the values as a vector. So in this case, instead of S apply, we have to use L apply, um, and this will just return a vector of all the elevations. And we'll just do the same for slope. And so if we just have a look at what's in here. This is the, yeah, this will be for elevation. So we've just done a bar, a, um, a histogram for elevation for each of the different national parks. And so you can see that, you know, as we said before, Springbrook CP, CP quite small. Um, whereas, you know, Lavington and border ranges very similarly have this kind of, this humped thing where there might be a few smaller mountain ranges and then quite a high proportion of, of higher areas. Um, and then Wollongbin is a 
kind of skewed to the left a bit. And we can do the same with slope. And what we can see here is that um, Limpenwood uh, and Namimba in particular are quite steep, that even though these are all fairly similar, they are the ones which are kind of skewed off to the right, as is Rosen's lookout. Um, and then things like border ranges is actually quite, you know, quite an easy uh, aspect to it. So it's just some of the, um, yeah, really interesting ways I think you can just do some simple summary statistics using raster, <coughs> and in particular cell stats, and get values. So this is where things have been uh, kind of a little bit turned around. So now we're going to start the actual modeling, but we are going to do a little bit more exploratory analysis in line with what um, someone over there was saying. Sorry, I can't remember who it was. And so we're going to use the extract function once again. We're going to extract from that all the points where lyrebirds are. And so now we have a data frame um, which has the elevation, the slope, the aspect, the vegetation, and the protected status of an area for every lyrebird observation in our data set. Um, oh, actually, because I don't think it's a data frame yet, so we have to coerce it and then just clean it up with an AOMIT. And so now we're ready to do all that stuff. But as someone mentioned before, you know, what about the observer biases? So we wanted to also have a look how representative this data frame, which we now have, will be of... Um, the areas where we're trying to model. And so this is where uh, we want to look at the major tourist destination in this area and any association that lyrebird observation has with that. And so we've created just a small file called tourist desk. Whoa, I pressed the wrong button. Okay. I just ran the whole thing, which included that RM list um, equals LS. And so we just got to give this a minute. Um, Sincerest apologies. Yeah? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, that said, I've done, this, I've done this at least 20 times to myself and I still do it, so I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't stop me. Um, yeah. But we can actually, you know, all we have to do is, for at least this section, because it's nearly time for the break, we'll just read in the lyrebird data, because that's the only pre-existing data we actually need for this. The rest of it we can do just using a couple small data sets we're going to import in this section. Mm, here it is. Okay, so just let lyrebirds read in. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna read in three more data sets. One is uh, a very small data set it's called tourist desk that just has three points with three major tourist destinations. Uh, the first is a, um, <coughs> sorry, a nature retreat called Binabara, the second is a nature retreat called O'Reilly's, and the third is a particular lookout called um, the best of all lookout, humbly. And so we just read that in. And so what this is, is just a little, um, just a little CSV with longs and lats. And so I think this is um, a really useful thing to know how to do, how to import just this very sort of simple data. And so to convert this, this data structure into geographic data, you have to use a function like this, there's another function similar to it just below. And what it does is it assigns as the geographic coordinates of desks the lon and lat variables. So if I change this and made it lat and lon, it should plot it the wrong way around with the y as the x and the x is the y, as far as I will. So if we plot that now, we'll just see three single points. And so here is O'Reilly's, here is Binabara, and here is the best of all lookout. Um, but they have, they have no geographic data with them, so they have no coordinate ref reference system. They just have um, <coughs> an extent and a particular point in the map which doesn't mean anything geographically yet. And so what we need to do is assign to it a CRS. And so we can say CRS of this object is the CRS, which is this fairly long one. And so it says it, it's a long lap projection. Um, it uses this particular datum, which is one used for, for instance, a lot of Google project products. And um, you also need this at the end for those Google product ones. And what this assigns to desks is a CRS, and now it means something 
intuitively. And so I just, I just pulled these values um, straight off of Google Earth. I just looked for the sections, clicked on it, extracted the longs and lats. Um, and so that's obviously only appropriate to do for a very small amount of data. Uh, you can't do that for thousands and thousands. Um, but for this, it's entirely appropriate. And I mentioned that, yes, so I mentioned that because that's why we have to put it into this projection with the longs and lats. Because if we tried just to put it into the projection that we're using for the other data, it simply won't work because I have no idea what the eastings and westings are for this data. So we put it into this easily uh, interpretable projection and then we can do a spatial transformation on it which will make it the same structure as all the other geographic data. So here we once again use that function sp transform. We do it on desks and now we give it the same projection that all the other data has. Yeah, so we, let's just plot. Um, Plot elevation. Oh, we don't have elevation. Plot dat. Ah, I forget what we called it. Oh, yeah, I deleted it. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So, what, so it makes sense now geographically where it all is. And so it's highly unlikely that these points are going to tell us everything. If we just want to say how many libraries have we seen at this one specific geographic point because it's just too tiny. And so we use a function called gbuffer. And what gbuffer does is it draws a buffer around each of these points to a specified area. So now that we have it in this EPSG code, um, the logical units that it uses is meters. And so we say feed into it the dests um, object. And we want a distance around each point of 1,000 meters, so 1K of each of these points. Uh, by ID equals true, that's just because we have multiple points. We need to specify that. And an ID. So the ID that's going to link them together is this column called feature, which is Binabara, O'Reilly's, or best of all, Lookout. Okay, and if we plot desks as well as the Liabird data, I no, we read in Liabird. got time before we read in the library data but we hadn't fixed up its geographical um, display sorry about that just speak bounds and so now we're all good Okay, so those are all of our Liabird observations, and if you should be able to see them. Those three points are our tourist destinations, as we decided to call them. And so you can see there's a lot of observations within here. That's O'Reilly's. There's a fair few here in Binabara and a very dense cloud here at the best of all lookout. But interestingly, and we're going to pursue this a bit, there's this really kind of long, straggly thing coming off the edge of Binabara here, and just because I'm familiar with this region. I'm aware that actually coincides with a really popular walk in this area. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. And so we'll just have a look at how many observations are in here. So once again, we'll use the extract function, which will tell us how many Liabirds have inside in each of the desks. And then we'll just have a look at it. And we can see that about 1.3% of all of our observations have been found at Binabara, just here. And then over 10% 10, 10 so 11% of all of our observations have been seen at O'Reilly's. So that probably indicates that, yes, there is an extremely strong observer bias in this data set where unless for some reason, if you happen to be at O'Reilly's, that actually supplies a better sort of environment for a liabird, which is obviously extremely unlikely. It's just probably a very popular place for tourists. Um, but as I said, there are many observations at Binabara which are associated with this kind of long tail going down. <coughs> And so I, w I want to check if that tail has to do with the existence of two tracks, the border circuit, uh, the Coomera circuit and the border trail. So using some data which I obtained from Wikiloc, um, I have these uh, two CSVs of the geographical points of these walk, as walkers have done these trails. So we just get those up. So we've saved um, these two strings, which are what the data is actually called, um, into an object called tracks. So we have track one and track two. So track one is the Coomera circuit, and track two is the border track. 
So once again, just a little loop. Obviously, could have put this in an L apply, but we're fans of loops for some reason. Um, just run them through there. And what this does is it creates two objects, one called TR1 and one called TR2, which are once again, oh no, I've made them line objects. Have I? Yeah, let's just see what TR1 is. Yep. So it's these geographically explicit points, um, which have the long and the lat. So if we go through here, we see that we've done, once again, specifying the long and the lat. And we've done it in a different way. We said is distributed as long plus lat. So there's two different ways that you can specify um, what the x and y coordinates are for data which isn't yet geographically explicit. Uh, then we say that as a line object. Um, that's just something you need to do with the SP package, which is a package heavily associated with this. So there's lots of different packages in R, which is for spatial analysis. SP has this requirement that this is a line object. So we save it as that. Um, and we assign it to a variable, which is TR, then whatever iteration we're up to. So we have TR1 and TR2 at the moment. So it's kind of a long way that you can do this. You can go through this kind of three-step process, which is how you s we had to do it in SP. So it takes a little, it uh, doesn't take a long time, but it's just kind of a bit of a pain to write. Uh, but then there's this relatively short way in R, which just gets you to list your two objects, which you want as the same thing. And then as an optional argument, you specify the CRS. So now we have this object called tracks, well, TRKS. And that's what it looks like. So these are the two major circuits in the area. On the right-hand side, we have the border trail. On the left-hand side, we have the Kuma circuit. And that was using a function in Rasta called SP lines. Rasta also has a function called SP polygons, which is very useful just for quickly making polygons in R because it's uh, in Rasta because going through the SP way can be a little bit tedious and you need to define many lists and all sorts of different object structures, whereas this just does it nice and directly. And so once again, this data, just like the desk, this doesn't make any sense to the rest of our liable data. And so we need to do a spatial transformation <coughs> where we put it into the same CRS. So we've done that and we do the plot, but because it's such a small area, it looks pretty much the same. And so we'll just finish this before the break. Now, once again, around this, we want to make a buffer. We don't need it to be a whole kilometer because it's very different to someone being at the O'Reilly's car park. They might wander around. This is a more directed thing. So we're still going to make it a bit of an area, but you know, people aren't likely to walk for one kilometer off the track to see a live bird. So we'll give it a width of 100 meters. And once again, by ID equals true because there's two different lines in here. Um, oh, yes. So now we need to... This, sorry, this is one of the little bit of annoying things with it. Actually, you know what? We might get back to this after the break because it's just about hit three. Um, do you guys want to finish this section or would you prefer to come back after the break? Finish the section? Finish okay, we'll finish the section. Um, so it's a, an, a bit of an annoying thing from generating spatial objects in R from scratch is uh, you also need to generate the data frame which is all well and good, but you need to make sure you get the row names in the data frame the same as the row names in the object. So here we have one object, its name is called one. So we have various data in here. Um, so we go in there, we, so the tracks object, we look at the line slot, and then we have one line. So we look at the first line, and that's different to what I thought it was. Yep, and it has a slot ID, and its ID is 1. Yeah, there it is. So this line, even though there's two lines there, is called line 1. And so we need to create a data frame which has all of the, which has row names corresponding to every object in this spatial layer. We only happen to have one layer in here, and so the only row name in the data frame needs to be 1. So we just create a simple data frame here. Uh, row names is C equals 1. And feature is C equals binabara. So a very simple DF we call temp DF. And it's just a data frame like this. So we have one feature, one spatial object here, which is called one, and the feature it's part of is called binabara, because it's the walks associated with binabara. And then we create a spatial polygons data frame with them. Um, and so remember, this is a spatial polygons because we, 
we've made it a buffer. So let's just plot that. So it's a polygon instead of a line now because it has this second, uh, sort of this other dimension to it which it didn't have before, which is width. And so we create a spatial polygons data frame uh, between them. So we have the buffer and the temp df. So all that means is that now this has a feature called feature and a particular attribute of this one, which is binabara. Okay, so if we wanted to, we had these two, these two disparate layers. Uh, we had desks and we had um, buffer. We want to join them together because the buffer is actually just a subset of the Binabara desks object. And so we use this function here called union, which brings them together. So let's just have a look at that. So we call it desks. Okay, now we have O'Reilly's best of all lookout and Binabara with the extended track going south. And just like we did before when we were wrangling with the New South Wales and National Parks and the Queensland National Parks, <coughs> sorry, we have to rename all the features correctly. And so for every, oh, let's just have a look at the features first. This is what the data looks like. You've got uh, this one, so three on the, we have four which are found in the left hand side which have been above. And that's because if you recall before, I said if we don't do the exclusions, we get kind of weird things. So we have five spatial objects in here. We have one, two, three, four, and then this smaller one is the fifth. So this fifth one is found in both data layers. Um, the walking tracks are only found in one, and the other three are only found in one. So that's, w that's one reason why I was doing all of that wrangling before with the national parks. So one way you can get around that is because these had the exact same name. They were both part of Binabara. Um, I just once again do this in, is an A stuff. So you look in feature one, everyone which is an A here, you fill it with the data from this one, chuck it in there. So we do that and then we delete the second one. And now we have, oops, that's fair enough. That's also fair enough. And now we have this neat little feature here which just has the five objects associated with three different locations. And so from that, once again, we're just going to do the extract. And we're going to show that the amount of lyrebirds is actually a little bit higher at Binabara than we originally estimated. It's got about another 1% of observations. And in fact, if we want to look at it, we can. We can plot desks and then plot lyrebirds. You can see that a lot of those observations do indeed seem to fall along, particularly the border track. And it's kind of sad for the Coomera circuit. No one really appears to care about it. But um, yeah, so once again, we have observed more um, observer bias in this. So when we actually run our model, if we were trying to really sincerely model the LIBA distribution, we'd have to kind of question our underlying data because there is such a clear um, link between walking trails, tourist areas to LIBA sighting. This isn't just a completely representative look at what is actually happening in this region. But for the purposes today, it's fine. Um, but that's just one way that we can explore our data and assess how good our models look like they may be. So, yep, it's 3.05, and I think that's definitely time for a break. So, cool. Thank you guys for your attention thus far. <laughs>